Okay, uh, hello everyone. I hope you can properly hear, hear me. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom, for uh, setting this up. Uh, thank you very much also for inviting me to your uh, sem seminar, uh, Giampiero and Tom. So um, I'm very happy to present a joint project here uh, on double machine learning, uh, a paper we have been working on uh, together. So this is joint work with Michaela Bier from the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research and uh, Lukas Lafas from Matej Bell University in Slovakia. And in a nutshell, what this paper is about is uh, the evaluation of causal effects, so-called average treatment effects, under the complication that the dependent or outcome variable of interest uh, is only observed for a non-random subset of the initial sample. And now what we want to do is we want to tackle uh, two issues at the same time. Uh, namely, the first issue is that the treatment is not necessarily randomized. So the variable of which we want to assess the causal effect uh, is not necessarily random. And so we want to use observed characteristics actually to control for confounders jointly affecting the treatment and the outcome. And the second problem is exactly this uh, non-randomness of the observability uh, of the outcome variable. So we have uh, non-random sample selection or outcome attrition. And what we assume is that we have uh, a potentially high dimensional set of control variables. And this is exactly where actually the so-called causal machine learning kicks in because by causal machine learning methods, we can actually um, pick the important confounders that drive the endogeneity either of the treatment or outcome attrition in a data-driven way under the assumption that our data set contains all the important confounders. So this is an identifying assumption we still need to maintain. But if this assumption is uh, satisfied, uh, then there might be a uh, Unknown, an unknown subset of covariates that is sufficient for properly estimating the causal effects. And then machine learning can be used to find this unknown subset of control variables among your high dimensional set of control variables. So um, the problem of uh, sample selection or outcome attrition arises uh, quite frequently in empirical uh, applications. So for example, if we are interested in assessing the returns to education, then we face the problem that wages or hourly wages are only observed uh, conditional on working. So only for those who are employed. And we don't know what the potential hourly word, uh, wage would have been for those who do not have a job. Or if we want to assess the effect of some educational intervention, for example, a voucher for some private school, um, then uh, the problem is uh, if we want to estimate the uh, performance of pupils, so for example, the effect of this educational intervention on a college admissions test, the problem we face is that we only observe the test scores for those who actually uh, take the test and not for those who abstain from being tested. And also, this decision can be endogenous and non-random, whether I take or do not take a test. Um, so uh, we have a double selection problem here into treatment and into outcome attrition. And a popular assumption for tackling selection into treatment, so for tackling the treatment and the genetic problem, is the selection on observers assumption, which assumes that we can observe all the variables that jointly affect the treatment and the outcome, and therefore we can control for these variables. Um, and more recently, um, this framework has been extended to the case that we have available a potentially large set of control variables. And so we can use machine learning methods to control for the crucial confounders in a data-driven way. That's, for example, uh, one approach which is called double machine learning, which is outlined, uh, outlined in a seminal paper by Czerno Shukov and co-authors in the Econometrics Journal in 2018, for example. 
And so what we do in this paper is that uh, we extend this double machine learning approach uh, to this second problem of observing the outcome only for a non-random subsample. Um, and at this point, I just want to mention if there are any questions or comments, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to interrupt any time and ask questions or make comments. So we will actually consider two um, scenarios in the paper. One uh, we refer to as the static confounding uh, scenario. And here actually uh, the idea is that the regressors or covariates, which you measure at baseline, that is to say prior to the assignment of the treatment, is uh, that these covariates are sufficient to control for, uh, for both the selection into treatment and selection into attrition problem. Um, so what we do there is that we either combine selection on observers assumptions or exogeneity assumptions for both the treatment and uh, outcome attrition, or we might even in addition claim, okay, our baseline characteristics are not uh, sufficient to control for the attrition problem. And in this case, we might have an instrumental variable. And then we claim conditional on the baseline characteristics measured prior to treatment. Um, actually, our instrument is as good as randomly assigned, uh, such that this instrument shifts outcome attrition, but does not have a direct effect on the outcome of interest. So a scenario uh, could, for example, be uh, the following. You want to measure the outcome uh, in a follow-up survey. And uh, not everyone responds to the follow-up survey. So you uh, actually cannot assess the effect of some training program on, on an outcome later on, because some people uh, drop out of the study. And then maybe you have an instrumental variable. For example, maybe you can randomize uh, financial incentives for answering um, the survey. And in this case, actually, you would have an instrument for this attrition process. And here we claim that our instrument is conditionally exogenous given the baseline covariates. But in this static framework, um, identification actually relies on baseline covariates only, plus possibly an instrument. We also consider the case of dynamic confounding. And here it could actually happen, or here we assume that some of the confounders of attrition and the outcome could themselves be affected by the treatment. And so therefore, uh, they are measured at a later point in time of the treatment. So to give you an example, you, you could be interested uh, in a training program on uh, hourly wage. And now the issue arises that um, actually the training program is taken several years later than when the hourly wage is actually measured. And of course, uh, then in these years, uh, in between, a lot of things could happen, right? Uh, and so if you actually wanna control for the non-randomness uh, of the missing data problem, you want to make sure you control for confounders that are closely measured actually um, to the outcome period. Uh, so uh, for example, it could be that the training program affects mental well-being in between, right? Uh, before the outcome is measured. And then this mental well-being could have both an effect on uh, your decision to find employment, right? Which then uh, determines whether you observe the wage outcome or not, and on the outcome of interest, so the hourly wage. And that suggests that you would need to um, control for confounders in a dynamic way, namely you wanna control for mental well-being at a later point in time than the treatment, such that controlling for health prior to treatment might not be sufficient to tackle uh, the endogeneity problem of the attrition process. Um, and so therefore we consider exactly this case as well and we assume that we can observe all these confounders. So this is again uh, ex an exogeneity or selection on observers assumption. However, in, in a sequential way, 
for the treatment and the attrition process. What we do in the paper is that we derive so-called doubly robust uh, score functions. And doubly robust score functions permit identifying the average treatment effect um, based on models for the treatment, the attrition process, which, it will, uh, which I will refer to as sample selection, and the outcome. And uh, by actually uh, using an estimation approach that uh, is based on information for all these three models, it turns out that this estimation approach is actually quite robust to misspecifications of some of your models. So for example, it can be shown that if you get the propensity scores, so the conditional treatment or sample selection probabilities correct, but you have an incorrect model for the conditional outcome, then you have, you, you have still a consistent estimator. Or the other way around, if you get the conditional mean outcome, um, so the regression model for the outcome as a function of the treatment and the regressors and the selection state correct, but you get the treatment probabilities and the attrition probabilities wrong, then again, you have a consistent estimator. This is what is called global double robustness in statistics. And um, the nice thing about these methods is that they also have a so-called local double robustness uh, property, namely, um, these estimators are first order insensitive to small deviations from the true model uh, for the outcome, the treatment, or the attrition process. Um, and uh, that means that you can also allow for minor mistakes in these models, uh, so in several of the models at the same time. And under specific conditions, you still get a root n consistent estimator of the treatment effect of interest. And this is an important property if we want to learn uh, the important confounders of the treatment, the selection uh, process, and the outcome based on machine learning, because machine learning are biased estimators. And um, that means they will trade off variance uh, and bias in estimation. And um, still, we can get a root n consistent treatment effect estimator if the machine learners satisfy specific conditions, in particular, if uh, the convergence rate of the machine learning algorithm is not smaller to n to the power of minus a quarter when estimating the outcomes, the selection, or the treatment models. And we will discuss one possible assumption that satisfies actually this convergence condition a little bit later on. Um, so if I just uh, may give a, a brief uh, review of the literature, uh, then um, there's actually a, a quite large, large literature on applying selection on observers assumptions to tackle outcome attrition. So these assumptions are uh, usually known as the so-called missing at random assumption, where you assume that given observed information in your data, your um, attrition process is as good as random. Um, there have also been doubly robust estimation approaches uh, relying on this missing at random assumption, for example, suggested by Robbins and co-authors. However, what we do in this paper is actually to, uh, we, we are combining two problems, right? Treatment selection and sample selection. And there are not so many other papers out there that do this. Um, one um, exception is a recent paper by Nagy 2020. And she actually uses a weighted M estimator, considering the same double selection problem with, uh, in, a, in a static framework with a missing at random assumption for, uh, for uh, the attrition process. And actually, also, this estimator satisfies the global double robustness property, as it is shown in the paper. However, it is not clear whether it also satisfies the local double robustness property, 
which is required for the application of the machine learning algorithms. And uh, therefore, uh, the two papers are distinct because we use a, yet a different estimator than this weighted M estimator. And for this estimator we use, we can actually show that it also uh, satisfies this local double robustness property, which is by the way also called Neyman orthogonality. Um, and um, therefore, um, we apply machine learning in our paper to find uh, important confounders in the data-driven way. And there's another strand of uh, the literature that assumes that the attrition process is non-random even after controlling for observed characteristics. So you cannot, it's non-ignorable. Um, and, and that actually in general means that you need to have an instrument as well for the, uh, for the attrition process unless you want to impose very strong um, parametric assumptions. There are these seminal papers by Heckman uh, in these so-called sample selection models. He actually uses parametric assumptions. But if you want to use uh, non-parametric versions of his model, like in DAS and COA for 2003, then in general, you need an instrument uh, for the attrition process. And actually, in two previous papers, I've also looked into this where I, I adapted this framework uh, to treatment evaluation, so to the double selection problem into treatment and uh, outcome attrition. Um, and uh, however, in these previous papers, I used inverse probability weighting by the conditional treatment or selection probabilities uh, to identify the effects. And uh, inverse probability uh, weighting is not robust, is not doubly robust, and therefore it has less desirable properties than the doubly robust estimator that we suggest here, and which we can then, for this reason, uh, combine with uh, machine learning-based covariate selection. So if there are no further questions, let me uh, come to the notation. So I will denote by D the treatment of interest of which we want to estimate the causal effect on the outcome Y. And then um, I have a binary indicator for whether the outcome is actually observed or not. So S stands for selection is equal to one. if The outcome is observed and zero otherwise. And then X in this first um, scenario um, are the baseline covariates, uh, which are measured shortly prior to the treatment. And in general, the treatment need not be binary. It can be uh, discretely distributed. So it can take values zero for no treatment and then one up to Q for Q different treatments. For example, different training programs like maybe a vocational training or uh, more academic class classroom training, for example. And then uh, using the potential outcome uh, framework advocated, for example, by Don Rubin, um, Y of D denotes the hypothetical outcome that would be realized under specific treatment state, uh, small d. And um, the observed outcome then, of course, only corresponds to the potential outcome for the actually received treatment, right? Whereas all the other potential outcomes are unknown. So for each individual, we only know the potential outcome uh, under the treatment state that the individual actually received. And that creates the problem of causal inference. And based on the assumptions uh, that I will uh, present, we can then identify average treatment effects. Uh, importantly, S may in fact be a function of the treatment. So training participation can have an influence on whether I find a job or not, for example, right? if uh, finding a job uh, is the selection variable, uh, but uh, the selection variable is not affected by the outcome and neither affects the outcome. If you want to put it this way, it is an outcome per se, right? So I, I find a job and if I find a job, then actually the uh, wage per hour is observed. Um, so this would be satisfied in this non-parametric model, where right? here the outcome is just the general function of the treatment, the covariates, and some unobserved 
uh, term or a vector of unobserved terms, u. And selection is a general non-parametric function of the treatment, the covariates, and uh, unobservable speed. So if I want to use a direct asymptotic graph, um, so a causal graph for outlining the first scenario we are looking at, then in this scenario, um, each error presents the causal effect of one variable or one set of variables on another variable. So we are interested in the average treatment effect of D on Y. And the problem we face now is that Y is only observed when S is equal to one. So S is the dummy for finding employment, for example. And the training can have an effect on this as well, right? And so now that there are uh, other uh, confounders that either jointly affect the treatment and the outcome or uh, selection and the outcome. So I need to uh, control for these other factors such that the treatment is as good as randomly designed uh, given X. But I also need the axis actually to uh, control for the endogeneity created by uh, the selection problem. Because um, what happens actually is if I, uh, if I control for S, right, then uh, through controlling for S, I uh, introduce an, a statistical association between X and D. And this is even the case if D and X are originally not associated or correlated with each other. But uh, uh, this is what we call collider bias in statistics or sample selection bias in economics. That means um, if two variables affect another variable, right, and we control for this other variable, then we introduce a statistical association or correlation between these initial variables. Uh, this is, uh, for example, uh, discussed extensively in the work by Judea Pearl. And so um, the assumption here is that after we control for X, all the confounding problems are solved. We may still have unobserved terms that either affect the treatment or the outcome or S, but we must not have unobserved terms that jointly affect S or Y, for example, after controlling for X. If I wanna put this into a potential outcome notation in terms of assumptions, then it means that the potential outcomes are independent of treatment assignment given X. So this is this uh, standard selection on observers assumption um, in policy evaluation. But now I also need a second assumption, right? With respect to the selection or attrition problem. And here the assumption is that the outcome and uh, selection are independent given the treatment and X. So going back here, you see the treatment and X are the only variables that are allowed to jointly influence S and Y. So therefore I can tackle the selection problem by controlling for D and X. And then finally, as we're considering non-parametric identification, I also need some uh, common support conditions so for example, I need the condition that the probability that, uh, that a certain treatment have, happens given X is larger than zero for any treatment state. And that means for any possible value of X, I have both treated and non-treated observations in the population, right? And this here is known as propensity score. It's the conditional treatment probability. And I need uh, some similar assumption also for the observability of the outcome. So that means for any combination of uh, the treatment and the covariates, um, some outcomes must be observable in the population. So then, uh, must, that means that the probability, the conditional probability of S being equal to one must be larger than zero. And I will refer to this as the sample selection propensity score, and to this as the treatment propensity score. Um, if these assumptions hold, I have in principle three different approaches, or maybe even more, to identify um, the effects of interest. So uh, what you see here is actually the mean potential outcome given X. 
And based on uh, our assumptions, this is identified by the conditional observed outcome or the, the conditional mean outcome given the treatment, given selection equal to one and X. So that this here is equal to this follows from the assumptions which we have imposed. So this suggests that I can just run a regression of Y on D, S and X to identify this conditional on X. And then I could actually average over uh, the distribution of X in my population to get the mean potential outcome in the total population. And if I do this for different values of the treatment, then I have the mean potential outcomes for various treatments. And then I can just take the differences between these mean potential outcomes to assess the average treatment effect. So the first strategy would be based on regression. The second strategy I can use is based on weighting by the inverse of the propensity scores, so-called inverse probability weighting. Um, this follows simply from basic uh, probability theory, right? Because um, actually one can easily show that uh, relying on the conditional mean uh, is the same as relying on, on, uh, on the inverses of the pro uh, propensity scores here, right? By simple application of the law of iterated expectations. So that means uh, here I have a second expression that I can use for identifying potential outcomes and treatment effects. Uh, and the second expression is based on the treatment and the selection propensity score. Now actually comes the clue. I can even combine these two approaches and then I get a so-called doubly robust approach. And um, to do this, I introduce here some shorthand notation. So mu of D, S and X is just uh, the uh, mean conditional outcome of Y given D, X, uh, S and X. And by P, D, uh, I denote the treatment propensity score and by pi of D and X, I denote the selection propensity score. And then one can show that the um, mean potential outcome is also identified by the expectation of this psi function. And this psi function here, as you can see, consists of both the conditional mean outcomes and the inverses of the propensity score. And uh, one thing that is noteworthy here is that, of course, if you take the iterated, uh, um, sorry, if you take the expectation of this thing, this would be uh, the same as just uh, the uh, regression based identification here, right? So the question is, what, what is this then here? Um, and, uh, and apparently, the, the expectation of this um, animal here must be equal to zero, right? Because the expectation of this. Here gives you already the mean potential outcome. And indeed, the expectation of this is zero because what you can see here is that this is a residual, right? So this is the error term, so the deviation between the regression function and the observed outcome. And so therefore, um, actually, this does not change anything in terms of the identification result. Uh, so also, therefore, uh, this um, expression here gives you identification of the mean potential outcome. So why should we do all the fuss if, uh, if this doesn't change anything in terms of identification? Well, it turns out it changes a lot in terms of uh, estimation. Because in estimation, we might have an incorrect model for um, the regression function. And in this case, this here works like a bias correction for the misspecification of the regression function if we get the propensity score models right. And it also works the other way around. We might also have the wrong propensity score models. But if we have this here correct, then um, the expectation of this is zero anyway. And um, that means we are still doing fine in terms of consistency. And now the important thing here is that uh, such nice robustness properties also hold locally. Uh, and this is what is called Neyman orthogonality. Namely, this expression here is first order insensitive to perturbations in these models for the outcome, the treatment, and sample selection. And this is a, a crucial condition for consistency when using machine learning uh, in causal inference. 
Okay, I also want to briefly outline further scenarios we look at, but we will not go into the details that much as we did uh, for this first case. So you see here, it looks all a little bit more complicated. In the second scenario, we actually assume that um, even after controlling for X, there are unobserved characteristics that jointly affect the selection and the outcome of interest. So um, for example, it could be that motivation to find employment is correlated with motivation at work. And then if we don't have indices for motivation in our data set, then we have the issue that some unobserved characteristics jointly affect S and Y. And then even after controlling for X, the problem is if we only take the sample then with observed outcomes, if we control for S, we introduce a statistical association between these unobserved variables and D, and therefore we have confounding. So a solution in this case is uh, the availability, availability of an instrument. So we need to have an instrumental variable that has an effect on the employment decision, but does itself not directly affect the outcome. And conditional on the treatment and your covariates, uh, this instrument must be as good as randomly assigned. So it must not be associated with unobserved terms that affect the outcome. So in the labor market literature, people have, for example, used the number of children as an instrument for whether uh, the mother works or does not work. And of course, uh, this is a suspicious instrument because uh, one could say uh, the number of children could be associated with many personality traits of the mother that also affect uh, the outcome, for example, the wage outcome. And so therefore, this might only be a plausible instrument if you have a large set of X variables that characterize uh, the family background well. Uh, in the application, we will actually consider this instrument as well, uh, but I'm uh, totally aware that, um, of course, that might be a more suspicious instrument than a truly randomized uh, instrument, like the one I mentioned before. If you randomize, for example, the um, um, uh, financial incentives to uh, answer follow-up survey, for example. So now everything uh, gets a little bit more messy and I will uh, not go into all details, but if you wanna use such an instrument in a non-parametric model, then first of all, in general, the instrument needs to be continuous. And actually continuity alone does not suffice, it must, actually also be quite strong the instrument that you use. Um, the reason is the following. After we uh, construct the instrument, uh, no, sorry, after we, uh, let me start again. If we have an instrument, we will actually construct the sample selection propensity score also based on this instrument. So you see here now this uh, pi, is now a function of d, x, and z. So it's the probability of selection given the treatment, the covariates, and the instrument. And if we refer uh, to the random variable, I will uh, actually denote this by capital pi. Now, what we need to do is we need to control for this selection probability even in the treatment propensity score. So we have now a sort of a nested propensity score model where the sample selection propensity score enters the treatment propensity score as well. And actually this uh, propensity score will also uh, need to be included in the outcome regression model. And um, this is uh, actually the non-parametric version of the Heckman type sample selection model. Those of you who know this model, they know that in the final outcome model, you include a so-called control function, namely you include the so-called inverse Mills ratio to control for, for the sample selection. And we uh, do not use the inverse Mills ratio because the inverse Mills ratio depends on a specific distribution of the error term, namely that the error term is normally distributed. But actually the inverse Mills ratio is just a, a special case of the general 
sample selection propensity score. And we use this directly as a control function. In order to be able to use this as a control function, um, we need some further requirements, um, some further structural requirements. Namely, I've mentioned before that there are unobservables that affect the sample selection. And um, we denoted uh, these unobservers by D. And some further structure I need to impose if I want to use this control function approach is that V is actually a scalar. And that might be either, uh, that might imply that there's either only one unobserved variable that affects sample selection, or this is an index of several unobserved variables. But if it is an index, it also has some strong implications, right? Because it means that you can form just an additive index of several unobserved uh, variables. So unfortunately, we need to impose these kind of structural assumptions um, when we rely on instruments. Um, and some of these assumptions are um, conventional assumptions in parametric models, right? Because in parametric models, we only have one um, unobserved term, which is the error term. Um, in the instrument case, if we impose these kind of IV assumptions, then we can only identify the effects among those that are observed. We cannot identify average treatment effects among those that are not observed. And um, this is something, dif uh, this is, a, uh, is different to uh, the scenario which we had before, where uh, actually selection was only on observables, right? Where there were no further variables, unobserved variables that jointly affect S and Y. But when there are further unobserved variables that jointly affect S and Y, then for those not observed, we can in general not even identify the treatment effects, not even if we have an instrument, because there might be effect heterogeneity in these unobserved. So if we want to identify the effects for the total population, we need yet another assumption. Namely, we need an assumption which is called conditional effect homogeneity, which implies that the average treatment effects are the same for individuals that are selected or not selected, conditional on specific values of the covariates, and the value of the unobserved term that affects selection. Because for this unobserved term that affects selection, we can control for by this uh, sample selection propensity score. But conditional on x and v, the average effects must be the same across the observed population and the total population. And that means conditional on X and V, the average effects must not vary with the unobservables U that affect the outcome, right? We have distinguished V, the unobservables that affect selection, and U, the unobservables that affect the outcome. And conditional on V and X, um, there's no effect heterogeneity in the unobserved um, factors U that affect the outcome. And we also need to strengthen the common support assumptions somewhat. Um, and uh, if all of these assumptions hold, then we can again derive identification results. And you see it here that uh, if we are just interested in the effects among the selected population, among the working, for example. Then we only rely on assumptions one, four, and five here. So five is the IV assumption. And then based on this expression, we can identify the mean potential outcomes. But if we want to actually assess the effects in the total population, then you see we also need to impose assumptions six and seven here um, about effect uh, homogeneity. And then we can identify the treatment effect in the total population as well. OK, if there are no questions at the moment, let me come to the final scenario that we consider. <clears throat> 
And this is now uh, this sequential or dynamic confounding um, framework. And what you see here is that we now uh, do not have an instrument anymore. So we assume selection on observers again. But you see here now these intermediate covariates M. And M, for example, this intermediate health state could be affected by training participation. And intermediate health could have an effect on the decision to find employment and actually on the uh, hourly wage burn. So we need to control for these intermediate covariates because otherwise uh, we have a, again a confounding problem if we control, if we condition on S equal to one. So these intermediate covariates could be a function of baseline covariates. So initial health could affect intermediate health and it could also be a function of, of the treatment. But that means we now need to include them as conditioning sets uh, for the attrition problem. And this is exactly what you see here in assumption eight. So we modify one of the previous assumptions. Now we claim that the outcome is conditionally independent of selection when including M here as uh, control variables on top of D and X. And we also need to modify the common support assumption here for selection then somewhat, namely the probability of selection must be positive for D, X, and N. And if we wanna impose this assumption, then we can again um, come up here with a doubly robust score function where you now see we have again the propensity scores in there. And the function is now somewhat longer than before, because you see we have here a second conditional mean function, which is actually a nested version of, of the of conditional means, if you want to put it this way, because the mu here is now uh, the conditional mean outcome given D, S, X, and M. And then if we average this regression function uh, over M conditional on D and X, then we get this new function here. And this new function now also enters this expression. But uh, we prove that based on this expression, we can identify um, the mean potential outcomes again. And so what we do is, depending on the identification problem, we use one or the other doubly robust score function. And then we estimate the so-called plug-in or nuisance parameters, right, which enter the score functions based on machine learning. And as mentioned before, this typically yields a biased estimator because, um, for example, by cross-validation, you trade off variance and bias when predicting these nuisance, parameter, nuisance parameters. This is known as regularization bias. Um, but as we use these score functions, that have this name and orthogonality, uh, these uh, estimators are pretty, the treatment effect estimator is pretty robust to uh, small biases due to this regularization bias. And when we apply this machine learning approach, there's a second very important um, uh, feature. And uh, those of you who are familiar with machine learning, they, uh, this might now ring a bell um, because we use an approach which is called cross-fitting. Cross-fitting means uh, that we randomly split our data set into two parts and we use the first part of the data set to estimate the model parameters of the outcome, the treatment and the selection models. So for example, in the first part of the data, we run a lasso regression to estimate the regression function for the outcome. And then after we have obtained the regression coefficients, we go over to the second part of the data. And in the second part of the data, we predict the score functions and estimate the mean potential outcomes based on these coefficients, which we obtained from the first part of the data, right? So we estimate uh, these models in the second part of the data based on the coefficients obtained from the first part of the data, 
and we compute the score functions and the treatment effects. That is to say, we have actually separated the problem of estimating the outcome or uh, treatment or selection models from the problem of estimating the average treatment effect. So there are no correlations between, there's no correlation between these two estimation steps. And by doing so, we avoid overfitting bias. Um, and uh, this is uh, very useful to uh, actually be able to show that we can obtain a root and consistent estimate. And from a practical perspective, however, this does not seem to be very efficient because if we do it this way, it, this naive way, we lose half of the sample, right? For, um, we only use half of the sample for treatment effect estimation. So therefore, and this is uh, why it is called cross-fitting, we can actually swap the roles in a second attempt. We can use the second part of the data to estimate the model uh, parameters uh, of these models. And then we take this to the first part of the data to estimate uh, the treatment effect. And then we simply average over the treatment. So this is very similar to cross-validation in machine learning, right? where we want to minimize the mean squared error. And uh, we cross-validate it. So that means we compute several mean squared errors out of sample. And then we average over these mean squared errors. So here, actually, we are not in a prediction framework. We are in a causal framework. Therefore, it's called cross-fitting. But also here, we perform model um, selection for these models in a different part of the data than estimating the treatment. And then we swap the roles. Now, switching the roles means that we don't lose observations for estimating the average treatment effect. And asymptotically, the, the variance of the average treatment effect is not affected by this cross-fitting procedure. So we have no efficiency loss. That is just the algorithm written down as I've just explained it. One final condition I still need to mention is the condition under which we really obtain root n consistency of the treatment effect estimate. Right? Because we have said, um, we use a function which is pretty robust to misspecifications of the outcome selection or treatment model. But still, we need some regularity conditions on how we estimate these models. And these regularity conditions are given here. But uh, to make it very short, the regularity conditions are satisfied if each of these nuisance parameters, so the outcome, treatment, or selection models, can be estimated uh, with a rate that is not less, um, slower than n to the power of minus a quarter, right? So we need consistent estimation and the convergence rate must not be smaller than this. So this rate is, for instance, smaller than the conventional parametric rate. It is also smaller than the non-parametric rate if I only have one continuous regress. Um, so that's even slower than that one. And um, people have... So, but it's a high level condition and people have thought about what the condition means for different machine learners. And to give you just one example for lasso regression, this condition implies that relatively to, uh, uh, or in relation to the sample size, the number of important confounders must be small, right? So that means um, there must be a relatively small amount of confounders which are responsible for most of the confounding problem. So let's assume you have, for example, 10,000 observations, right? 10,000 observations. And uh, then relative to the sample size, the number of confounders that are important must be small. So let's say maybe 50 confounders uh, are responsible for most of the confounding problem which is not so unrealistic in labor market applications, right? Where we have things like socioeconomic factors, previous work experience, education, and so on, that are usually considered to be the most important drivers of both training participation and wages. And uh, yeah, in, in conventional studies, usually we, we often have something like 30 to 50 
uh, covariates we control for. So in, in, uh, in, in Lasso regression, this is called approximate sparsity. Approximate sparsity means that uh, a few variables relative to the sample size account for most of the confounding problem, right? So you have an approximately sparse problem, meaning that other, other factors can also play a role, but their role is rather minor in the confounding. And it, it, if this holds, then you can actually show root n consistency for all the estimate, uh, for all uh, the approaches we have suggested. And you can also, you also naturally get a formula for computing the variance uh, based on the conventional GMM approach. So in the interest of time, I will skip the simulation study. I just, uh, in the last few minutes that I have, um, I just wanna actually give or provide you with an application to give you an idea in which contexts these methods could be applied. And what we do is uh, we take a look at the so-called job core experimental study. And job core is a publicly funded training program for disadvantaged individuals that are between 16 and 24 years old in the US. And the idea is to provide them with training programs. So for example, vocational training or classroom training where you can get a GED, which is something equivalent to a high school uh, certificate, in order to make them fit for the labor market to increase their chances to find employment, for example, or um, also to find better jobs. Now, this is actually an experiment where people are randomly assigned uh, into access um, to job corp training. And even though the assignment itself is random, the actual choice of training programs is not random anymore. So whether you then actually choose vocational training or classroom training is not random anymore. So we do have a treatment selection problem. And we are interested in the effects of this um, program on hourly wages of the female subsample. And we consider hourly wages either in the last week of the first year, so pretty close to treatment participation, or four years after randomization. And then, in, um, and, uh, then of course, we have the problem that there might be some intermediate confounders that we need to take care of. And hourly wages are only observed conditional on finding employment. And this is our S. So um, in this um, application, we actually have hundreds of baseline covariates available about the socioeconomic uh, status, also about the labor market history, whether these um, participants had some work experience, also the crime history, health, health behavior, and so on and so forth. And then here we will consider as an instrument uh, the number of young children in the household as, as baseline. Uh, so we will actually consider the static framework both with and without the instrument. And uh, then uh, we will also consider for uh, the outcome four years later, we will also consider the dynamic framework. So we will actually um, control for intermediate covariates. And also here we have actually hundreds of different uh, uh, covariates available. Because actually in this uh, experimental study, people were re-interviewed several times. And here as machine learning algorithm, we use the random forest, which is a non-parametric algorithm. It is uh, actually in spirit similar to kernel regression. But uh, the difference to kernel regression is that it can, in a data-driven way, focus on the covariates, which are uh, important confounders or predictors of the outcome treatment or selection. Whereas in standard kernel regression, you need to pick the control variables yourself. So I saw uh, someone raised a hand and had a question. Can you please go ahead and ask your question? I think that's David's question. Hello. 
Hello, David. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> All right. I, I'm a little worried. Well, I, this can wait to the end, actually. I think you hadn't finished, had you? Uh, I, I think I prefer to wait to the end before asking. <laughs> okay. Whatever you prefer. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I will finish in two minutes and then okay. we can discuss it at the end if you want. Yeah. Okay. So um, here you actually see our uh, sample. So we actually have um, 200 observations that do not participate in any program, which are the control units. And then we have more than 800 observations that either attend academic training or vocational training. And I would say that uh, actually, this is sort of the lower bound in terms of sample size, where in my opinion, one should apply such uh, causal machine learning approaches, because in general, you need more observations than for classic or classical statistical approaches, uh, where you as a researcher select the control variables. So what do we find? Actually, in the short run, we, we don't find much. <laughs> so uh, what you see here is actually the average treatment effect on hourly wage. So this is measured in US dollars. And we see for both academic and vocational training negative effects when we base it, when we base estimation on theorem one, that is to say, if we assume a missing at random assumption for um, the selection process. But what you also see is that the standard errors are relatively large. And so therefore, we cannot reject the null hypothesis of no effect on short-term wages. The result remains pretty much unaffected if we also use the instrument. So also here, the results are rather similar. And again, uh, under the case that, that the instrument is, uh, might be suspicious, right, which we use here, even though we do control for a wealth of background characteristics. But in any case, um, we don't find significant short-term effects. And so therefore, we also um, apply this approach of imposing a sequential selection on observers assumption to assess the longer run effects on wages four years later. And there, actually, we do find a positive and statistically significant effect for vocational training. For academic training, well, it's not statistically significant at the 10% level, but it also points into rather in, into a, a, a positive um, uh, direction. Um, of course, we test a lot of um, hypotheses here. So strictly speaking, we should control here for multiple hypo hypothesis testing. But uh, this last effect would uh, even survive this, actually, when having a, a, a false error, error rate correction for multiple hypothesis testing. And um, so let me conclude here. We offer a method for assessing treatment effects under the problem of outcome attrition and in the context of a potentially high dimensional set of control variables, where we then pick the control variables in a data-driven way by machine learning, we show that under specific conditions, the estimator is rude and consistent. We have a simulation study and an application to the job core program. And if you want to try it out yourself, the estimator and uh, several other double uh, machine learning estimators are available in the causal weight package for R, which uh, Hugo Podori and myself uh, programmed, and which is publicly available on CRAN. So thanks a lot uh, for your attention. And I'm really happy to discuss more questions or comments now. I see there's another reaction in the chat. Aha, OK. So it was just to say goodbye. Um, so uh, then for all of you who still have time, uh, it'd be very happy to yeah, discuss further implications of this method.